Okay, so I think we'll get started. So thank you everybody who's filling out the poll. Uh, it's fun to see where everybody's from. We have a lot of people from near us, but from throughout the United States and uh, Europe, South America, Asia, Southeast Asia, and other. So welcome to everybody. I'm Dave Waits, and I'm here with uh, Pia Sorensen. And this is the science and cooking lesson, uh, science and cooking uh, lecture. Uh, we have this every week. Uh, we like to share what we do in our science and cooking class at Harvard with everybody else. Uh, this is sponsored by uh, Gastronomy Solutions, 1933, Escada, the Harvard Mersec, uh, Shimadzu, Brad and Taylor, and Samnik. The next slide tonight, we're very privileged, especially on today, Indigenous Peoples Day, where we have uh, Louis Allen Frank. Um, and I'm going to let uh, Pia introduce her a little bit later in, uh, in, with more details about her. Uh, we always start by trying to explain just a little bit of the science that we discuss in our class while we do this. But we also, when we have our normal public lecture at Harvard, we have a tradition that some people come every week. And so we do a little quiz on what happened in the last week. And this time, we actually had a homework quiz. So on the next slide, the last time we had this uh, lecture was actually two weeks ago. We had Chef Nina Compton from New Orleans, and she made nochi. And we learned how to measure the elasticity of nochi. And we put out a challenge. Please measure the elasticity of nochi and send it to us. And the next slide uh, shows some of the, uh, or shows why we, what, what our motivation was. We said, look, we will uh, look at everything we looked at and uh, you will win, the, the best uh, uh, submission will win both a book, this is a book that's coming out about the class, Science and Cooking. It's coming out uh, at the end of this month. You can pre-order it in the chat. And our special apron, which is an apron from the class that has all the equations of the week on it, as well as some of the foods that we cook. And we got a lot of really, really cool submissions. It was amazing what we got. Here's some examples of it. People plated things nicely. People weighed things very carefully, uh, very precisely. They were very creative. They used a, a jar of food. They used a, 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 a aluminum foil, a box of aluminum foil. They used all sorts of things as the weight. And they made all these beautiful measurements. It was fantastic. It was got really good uh, results. And we have some winners. In the next slide, these are the best, uh, the best contributions. So the winner, and the winner gets both a book and an apron, and it's Stacy Fontenot. And so I'm not sure if you're listening, but if you are, congratulations. Uh, you get both a book and an apron. We have some runners up. Yes, Pia's clapping. Thank you, Pia. Runners up, you get aprons. We have Jack Chandler, Andrea Tabo, and Nadia Fernandez. And we have some special mentions, uh, also really good things. Nur Aza Yan and Victoria Hyung Han. So congratulations to everybody. Really, it's fantastic. We really uh, love the idea that you uh, take this and you enjoy, it, you learn with us, um, and that you can do something with the science behind the cooking. So let's turn to what we'll talk about tonight. On the next slide, There's a bunch of foods here. Oh, they look good. But Pia, I think you were going to talk about this and tell us what they have in common. Yes, indeed. So, okay, so my question to you all is what these foods may have in common. And you would look at them at first and wonder to yourself, well, I'm not sure they have very much in common at all. Maybe you could say that they're all delicious, um, which in that case, I think that would be a pretty good answer. 
Um, this up here in the upper left is ceviche, and here we have steak, molten chocolate cake, pasta, and down in the lower right we have spherification. And if you don't know what that is, don't worry about it. Um, it is a delicious food that was, was created by Ferran Adria and is kind of one of the hallmark dishes of the molecular gastronomy movement. So if, if, if you've been exposed to this, uh, good for you, and if not, don't worry about it. So the question is, what do they have in common? And if you look at them for a bit, you may realize that all of them have something which has slowly moved into the food. So in the case of ceviche, which you make by putting raw fish into lemon juice, um, it is the hydrogen ions which have diffused into the fish. In the case of steak and molten chocolate cake, it is heat which is slowly diffused into, into the food, so the outside is a little bit more cooked than the, the inside. Pasta, what happens when you cook pasta is that the dry pasta has water slowly diffusing in um, and that cooks the pasta. And in spherification, it turns out it's, it's actually calcium ions that are moving into the sphere. And those are cross-linking alginate ions and that's forming the sphere, which has this beautiful, delicious liquid in the center. So all of these have the concept of diffusion in common. And as it turns out, when we cook them, we are really manipulating the scientific concept of diffusion. So I'll show you what, you, what I mean. Here is a recipe for ceviche. And the recipe says to chill for uh, a day or overnight. And the reason you don't want to do it longer than that is because you don't want the hydrogen ions in the lime juice to move too far. When you're cooking molten chocolate cake, you have very specific instructions that you should bake for 12 minutes, not 13, not 10, 12 minutes, and then you know it's done. And the reason is that then the heat has moved just the appropriate distance, not too far, not too little, but just the appropriate distance. Same is true for steak, cook for five to seven minutes. We do that because we don't want the heat to move too far. Um, pasta, you cook it until it is just al dente because you don't want the water to move so far into the pasta that it just becomes soggy and not has the right texture. And same thing for spherification. Turns out this is a recipe for spherification and you uh, incubate these spheres for 30 seconds. And it's very important that you don't do it for longer because even just a few seconds more and the calcium ions will move too far. So the question for all of these recipes, and I know that was kind of a whirlwind, but, but the question for all of them is, well, how do you know what the number is? How do you know if it's overnight or for 12 hours or for 30 seconds or for 15 minutes? What is it that determines when the food is done? And to understand that, we really have to understand how the hydrogen ions, how the heat, how the water, how the calcium ions get into the food. And I think Dave is going to tell us about that. So uh, let's look at the next slide. So we have a little cartoon here. Um, and just imagine that uh, we have this line of ions, this uh, a solution of ions. It's shown by the red here. And um, uh, the blue is where the corn is. And as we uh, step through the, um, step through the, the, uh, the slides, and I'm going to ask Pia to do that, to step through the slides. And you'll see that the red goes to the left, it goes to the right, it slowly creeps in, it moves in slowly. Eventually it reaches the, uh, some distance. And if you just look at some point at some distance, um, that distance is L. And um, the question is, can we calculate what that L is? And we can. For that, we use the diffusion equation. That's shown on the next uh, slide. So this is the equation, and this is our equation, and we have a tradition in this class, and I will insist on we all do it. We clap when we see an equation. So everybody should clap. They see an equation. That's what we do in class. We do that here. So let's look at the equation. It says that the distance, that distance, the uh, characteristic distance in which whatever is diffusing, in this case, the ions, it could be the heat, it could be the ions, the salt, whatever is diffusing, the calcium, that distance 
depends on the time times the diffusion coefficient. And the diffusion coefficient is something that is characteristic of whatever you're looking at. It's different for heat, for ions, for um, uh, whatever you're is doing the diffusion, the, the calcium ions, the, the pH, whatever is actually diffusing, there's a diffusion coefficient. And it goes as the square root of the time times the diffusion coefficient. And the square root of the time, what that means is it goes slower and slower and slower. So it goes in quickly, but then it slows down. It goes slowly. So if you plot the distance as a function of time, it slows down and takes longer and longer at long times. And let's see what that, how that affects the food. If we go to the next slide. Ah, so in this case, we're going to do something a little special. We're going to use in, in, the, in the lesson, in the, in the lecture, we're going to also talk about the effect of ash. And we thought maybe we should say something about ash. I know Pia knows a lot about that. So Pia, maybe you can explain a little bit about the ash. Yeah, I, I do because so we've talked about this thing, that this concept of diffusion and how things move into food. But of course, that title for today's topic is involves words like culinary ash, which may not sound um, super obvious what that would mean. So I just want to think a little bit about what, where that might come from. So here's a log of wood and uh, you make ash from wood or you make ash from, from, from burning um, other plant materials. And plant materials contain basically three things in various variations. Um, they contain hemicellulose, which is a matrix of polysaccharides. So lots of carbons, lots of carbon rings, lots, lots of oxygens and hydrogens. It also contains cellulose, a big chunk of it is cellulose. Cellulose consists of polymers of glucose. So also lots of carbons, lots of oxygens, lots of hydrogens. And then it consists of lignin, which is a polymer of aromatic um, uh, alcohols. And you can see that all of these molecules, they're big and complex, they're matrices and, and polymers, but they all have in common that they have an awful lot of carbons. And if you're not used to looking at these kinds of wiggly molecules, all of these um, edges are carbons and it has a lot of oxygens and a lot of hydrogens. So then the question is, if this is what plants is, are made of, what happens when we burn them? What happens when we burn plants or wood? And it turns out that if we do this in the presence of enough oxygen, um, you'll notice that, that Chef Lois goes outside when she does this, then you have something that is called complete combustion. And when, when you do this, the hydrocarbons, which is all the lignin, hemicellulose and cellulose, they burn down and they make carbon dioxide and water. That's it. Usually it turns out though, we don't have complete combustion because there isn't enough oxygen around. And so we have something which is called incomplete combustion, which is what happens when there's not enough oxygen. And what you get in this case is that the lignin and cellulose and cellulose, they're broken down, not just to carbon dioxide and water, but also to carbon monoxide and carbon. And you also get some other things you also get flavor molecules, right? So this is when we smoke foods, these are the flavor molecules who are after, and we get different flavor molecules depending on what kind of plant or what kind of wood we're using. And we also get minerals. And it turns out the most common mineral is calcium carbonate. Um, looks like this, if you write it out in, in, in the middle right here. And calcium carbonate is important for many reasons. Number one is that it contains calcium. Number two is that it contains carbonate. And if you look at this, um, and if you're a chemist, you, you'll, you'll know this, but if you're not, I'll just tell you that what this molecule easily does is it easily takes up hydrogens, which means it is a base. It has a pH of anywhere from nine to, to 12 or maybe even more. And this basic, the fact that it's basic as opposed to acidic is one of the reasons you can use wood ash to fertilize soil. It is also one reason that makes it 
such a fantastic thing to cook with. So what happens when we now take the ash with all of these things in it and um, that, that we, we add our, uh, we have a solution of ash and we add ground up, we have, and we add flour to the solution. So here is sort of a little cartoon of what a corn flour particle would look like. And it's a solution with ash. What happens is that the, the ions and the molecules on the outside will diffuse into the little flower particle. So it'll kind of look like this, where you have lots of ions here, and this is the flower particle. And over time, they're diffusing inwards and they're changing the flower particle as they move into the, into the, the, the corn mush. So what ends up happening is that the water makes the starch granules swell. They get bigger like this. And the calcium ions and the hydroxide ions cross-link the long polymers of proteins and carbohydrates. They cross-link and denature um, the, the proteins. And, and you get this kind of gel that you'll see in, in action as Chef Lois cooks. Okay. That was a lot of information. Um, I think this is now time for me to introduce our visiting speaker. And it is a huge honor to have chef and Dr. Lois Frank join us today. Um, Lois has in various ways spent her, a lot of her career thinking about how to understand Native American cuisine how to further the understanding of it amongst all of us. She has a PhD um, from, the, uh, from the University of New Mexico in culinary anthropology. She is the author of a James Beard award-winning book called Foods of the Southwest Indian Nations. And she is an instructor at Santa Fe School of Cooking and the Institute of American Indian Arts in Santa Fe, New Mexico. So please join me in welcoming Chef and Dr. Lois Ellen Frank. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm gonna, uh, we're gonna go through a little history of uh, culinary ash and why it's important in uh, not only native foods, but, but the history uh, of these foods. So I'm gonna, um, share my screen with you and uh, we're going to take a look at uh, why the ash is important. So um, I'm gonna introduce myself in the native way. My name is Lois Ellen Frank. I'm from the Kiowa Nation on my mother's side. I am Sephardic uh, Jewish on my dad's side. And I am the chef owner of a company um, that is native owned called Red Mesa Cuisine uh, in Santa Fe, New Mexico. We specialize and our mission is to bring uh, contemporary cuisine into the contemporary kitchen or the Southwest kitchen uh, using traditional foods. And uh, this is important because we buy uh, indigenous foods from native sourced uh, purveyors, um, we're very particular about uh, where our food comes from. We don't serve any commercial meats, so we only use wild game and lots of plants. Uh, and that's because the native diet uh, in a ratio was about 90-10 uh, if we look uh, back to the past to see what we do. I wanna just talk about quickly some of the other projects. I work with the New Mexico Department of Health. Uh, we do a program on training other cooks how to use uh, native foods, uh, healthy food preparation. One of the things that's happened over time is uh, sometimes the cord is broken with indigenous knowledge. Uh, and so uh, we've been working with organizations. This is another one where we use the medicine wheel as a model. Uh, fruits, grains, vegetables, and beans, water, of course, on the outside, very important. And we ask each indigenous community to identify what the indigenous foods are in their own community, and it's gonna vary. East Coast uh, water tribes are going to have lobster or clams or mussels or oysters. Uh, 
tribes in the center might have corn, beans, and squash as their foundation, the northwest coast, maybe salmon. So different foods are going to, to differ. Uh, but I think one of the most important messages is that uh, as a, a Native American chef, um, I uh, work to feed the body, but it's important uh, that we nurture the soul, that we take uh, a look at um, why these foods are important, not only how they are important into the physical body. And uh, we're big advocates of taking Western science and bringing that in collaboration uh, with an indigenous science, uh, which has always been uh, through our oral traditions. And so Western and indigenous uh, come together uh, in this. Um, in order to do this, uh, we have to understand our past. What is our past uh, and uh, how these foods can be used in contemporary kitchens. Some foods work well, others do not. They refuse, refuse to go into the modern kitchen. Uh, we take a look at that, at why. And then we look at the timeline. So the pre-contact period, going back 10,000 years up until first contact. So 1492, what a, an appropriate day to be presenting this because today, of course, was Columbus Day and now is Indigenous Peoples Day or we're migrating uh, into changing this from first contact period, 1492, to about the eight, mid 1800s uh, and then the mid 1800s during the government issue period uh, where Native people were forced off their ancestral homelands uh, onto lands that they didn't know. They lost their sense of science, their sense of place, their sense of how to live in the world. Uh, so it was a very problematic period. And then the period we are now, the new Native American cuisine, which takes the old and brings it into a very contemporary uh, setting, which would be the modern kitchen. And, and the story of all of this, the story of, of ash and the story of cooking is really the story of corn. Um, corn is the essence of life uh, throughout the Americas. It is the uh, dominant grain uh, that has sustained Native people. Uh, the history and the story of corn goes back about 9,000 years uh, based on oral or traditional TEK, so traditional ecological knowledge. Western science uh, brings it in a little bit less using uh, radiocarbon dating from archaeological sites. So uh, they don't exactly match, but they match uh, fairly closely in the term of how long these grains. And of course, this is uh, the corn poster. Uh, it's called Indian Corn of the Americas. And what's so fascinating is uh, I, I tried to look exactly when, but in uh, the late 1980s, early 1990s, I flew out to Harvard and I spent a week in the seed and nut room uh, in the anthropology department. It was a tiny little room filled with corn and we photographed the Harvard collection, which you see here. So this collection for this poster comes from uh, one of the scientists that worked at Harvard uh, in the 1940s and uh, this collection, I don't know if it's still at Harvard, but it was certainly in the late 1980s, early 1990s. Um, corn is Z, is the genus. Uh, Z maize, maize, corn, Indian corn, it's a perennial plant uh, and it's dependent on man. And many native people have many myths or stories around that, that it was a gift from the gods given to native people. Uh, and so teosinte, which is a wild grass, is the ancestor uh, to corn. Um, and uh, I put this in because corn is much more than food. Uh, she is in fact a creation, a gift, a storyteller. She is ceremony, she is song, she is prayer, she is maiden, she is mother, sister, healer, medicine, sustenance, food, cuisine, art, and the essence of life. Uh, corn is a part not only of place, it is very place-based, but also culture. Here we see cultures to the south of us. You can see corn uh, in many of the uh, structures. Uh, it's in the stones, it's in the pyramids, it's in the gods, it's in many of the deities. Uh, and it's also north uh, of that. Um, here we see corn uh, in Hopi pottery. You can see a woman grinding. Uh, clouds nurturing all those little dots are corn kernels, uh, very important uh, to both the uh, cultures to the north and to the south. Uh, corn can be grown with water. It can also be grown without water. 
So many um, uh, cultures here in the Southwest have ceremonies. This is Wilmer, he's dry farming. And then here is another farm about 30 miles to the north. Look at the yield, much different, different ways of growing, also dry farming, but a little bit different uh, in their approach. Uh, corn, you'll notice the stalk on the left, the actual corn uh, or corn, what we know is corn on the cob, very close to the ground and that's because of the winds. And so the corn has actually adapted uh, to its environment so that it can grow. Uh, in areas where we have river or we can use irrigation, the corn grows much larger uh, uh, and bigger because of course uh, water. But the corn in this area uh, has what we call elongated roots those root systems can go down anywhere from 18 inches to three feet, uh, whereas corn on the East Coast, uh, for many of you on the East Coast, that corn would have very shallow roots and you would mound when you plant it. Here we waffle because we wanna contain that water uh, in the earth and bring uh, as much water as possible to the corn. Um, this was uh, from this year, one of my students, I teach an indigenous food class and uh, why would we plant? Why would we plant without water uh, to carry out a way of life, a calendar um, ceremony, and um, also uh, having a good heart and bringing families together and learning roles uh, and position uh, within a tribe or a community. And so uh, I was actually taught growing up by my mom that corn comes in four colors. Those are the four colors on the medicine wheel. Those four colors also represent the four races of man, which fill the circle. That circle is the circle of life. Here we see Calandra. She's about to uh, go into a ceremony called Kinalda. And in Kinalda, they use the ash with the corn, dig a big hole in the ground. That corn uh, makes a cake and that cake uh, represents the transition or coming of age to this young woman, uh, so still used. So protecting corn, vitally important uh, because it is one of the most sacred foods. So we're very particular about seeds and seed saving using heirloom corn uh, and avoiding those GMOs and avoiding having those GMOs get into our strains of pure indigenous corn. And so, Ash comes into corn uh, as a process uh, initiated about 3,500 years. So if corn is 9,500 years old, uh, this process, this science of using corn uh, coming in much later, about 6,000 years later, corn is soaked in the ash. It's washed, cooked, and then hulled. Uh, when we steep the grain, when we use this on the corn, it makes the corn more digestible, but it also adds nutrients, as Pia said, uh, calcium being one of the largest, most profound, as well as other uh, minerals from the ash. Uh, and by releasing these vitamins that were stored within uh, the endosperm and the germ of the corn kernel. What's fascinating is when we use this process of adding ash to the corn and to our food. Uh, not only does it increase the calcium content, but uh, the US government came in and said, oh, native people, you guys need uh, milk, you need calcium. No, we do not. We have never needed milk. Uh, it, we get it from the ash and from this process of using ash uh, in our food. So once the uh, corn has gone through a nixtalamization process, the masa can be used fresh or it can be dried and ground into a powder uh, for tamales. Here we see native people to the south processing corn, using corn in a mill after it's been soaked, uh, and then using that corn to make a masa, that masa then made into a tamale. Here we see a banana leaf wrapped tamale, uh, chilies, beans, squash, plants, spices, also used in conjunction uh, with that masa uh, for flavor and flavor profile. So uh, ash, very important. Uh, many of the tribes also to the north of the border use ash. Uh, some of the tribes that are actively still using ash would include Pueblo cultures of the Southwest, uh, Navajo culture, Eastern Woodland Nations, the Onondaga Nation, as well as tribes uh, in the Great Lakes. So the significance of ash in Pueblo is not only that it dates back thousands of years, uh, this 
process or this nixtalamization. This is the science. Uh, this is from also one of my students, but ash also is, is not only used for cooking, but when taken from the hearth, uh, the belief is that it provides strength to the wearer. So you may see ceremonies or dances and ash may be used uh, on the skin uh, for the benefits associated with that. The ash that we used here, so Pia showed you a wood, we actually use bushes. Uh, we use juniper, so the branches of the juniper tree, uh, onion, making an onion ash, or the four-winged salt bush. And these are all ashes uh, that we would use not only to cook with, to flavor with, uh, but also uh, as part of that nixtalamization process. Uh, here we see Hopi corn. You can see the dried corn. Once it's been soaked in the ash, it puffs. Uh, we loosen or remove the skins. Uh, and here you can see the ash, those skins starting to come off. The inside of that corn is what we grind and what we use uh, as the masa. And so that would be used. We want the ash to burn past the brown stage into the white stage. Uh, once we get white ash, that ash is strained uh, for culinary use, and that's the ash that we use, and that's the ash I'm gonna be cooking with. Um, so here is what's called pasole here in New Mexico and other parts of the country. You may know it as hominy corn. When you cook it, this is dried, it puffs. Uh, the most common is white. Second most common is blue. Red is very rare. It's a little bit harder to process and get those skins off. And so it's much more expensive uh, and harder to do and fewer and fewer people are doing it. Uh, here again is the red corn. The red corn can be ground and then ash added to that ground uh, corn as well. Here we see the blue corn made into a flower. That flower would be added to the ash. So there are lots of native cooks in this area. This is Norma Naranjo from the Feasting Place from Okeawinge Pueblo, teaching about corn, the process of cooking with ash, of course, standing outside with her Orno oven. The Orno was named by the Spanish because it looked like a beehive, and that would be the outdoor oven uh, that we would use. You're gonna see a, a video, and I'm gonna just make it a small amount in a walk. Here we, on the left, we see a corn pozole. This is pre-contact, first contact. So we're bringing in uh, some of the pork that was introduced into this region uh, by Europeans, specifically uh, the Spanish, and then a pre-contact dish on the side using Anasazi beans, corn, uh, and um, New Mexico green chili. So uh, very important, here we see uh, corn tortillas made from this treated, nixtalamized white corn. Corn tortillas are usually made with either white corn, yellow corn, or blue corn, white corn being the most common. Here you see masa, a tamale. We've added red chili, and then inside that masa, that treated nixtamalized corn, uh, black beans and corn kernels. So the Native American pantry uh, always includes corn as well as beans and squash and chilies and tomatoes and potatoes and wild onions and garlic and many uh, of the indigenous ingredients to the Americas. Uh, so why, who cares, right? Why is this important? This is important because this is a, now a movement where Native American communities, it's not only here in the United States or in the Americas, but around the world, Native communities are maintaining, renewing, and revitalizing their traditional food ways. And this is important. And the way that they do that, this is the Native American food movement, which everybody can participate in. We need land. We need to save seeds, heirloom seeds for plant propagation. We need to know how to gather or harvest or farm. We need cooking and nutrition classes. So we need Western science to come together with indigenous science. And then the outcome is a revitalization of not only the cultural, spiritual, but the physical connections to the environment uh, for health and wellness. So food sovereignty, a very important uh, concept. The idea that we have the right, it's not a privilege, it's not, anything other than a right to have our own foods and access to those foods 
uh, and not just enough calories, but the idea of being able to grow and process our own foods. Here again, the idea of traditional ingredients, using them with culinary ash. I make all my students grind. It takes about 45 minutes to finely grind uh, half a cup. So a lot of uh, calories being burned, a lot of um, uh, process. This is Travis Miller, um, and he is grinding. So both men and women uh, grind. This is also one of my students. Uh, Kelly Tungovia, and um, this is her corn grinding ceremony where corn is being initiated and given to her. Uh, she has to grind the corn. She has to know how to make uh, some of the specialty corn dishes in her Hopi community, and she grinds four days and four nights to learn this, uh, and then that makes her uh, very valuable to her community because she understands the process. Peaky, this is a paper thin tissue cornbread, one of the oldest known cornbread recipes on the planet going back about 2000 years. You can see there's a bag of ash. Uh, Kelly is making the Hopi uh, on a stone with an open fire uh, and then um, that paper thin tissue cornbread, here's another, is just rubbed onto that hot stone. So the ingredients are flour or, or uh, corn flour, ash, and water, and then it's made into rolls. It's also called paper bread because it's a paper thin or newspaper bread because it represents that. Here's a little bit more modern, how we would cut it or serve it uh, with a, uh, this is with a tepary bean hummus um, and bring it into a contemporary setting, even though it's a very old and very traditional uh, way to use uh, corn with ash. Uh, this is another uh, dish, uh, blue corn pancakes, also made with cornmeal, ash, a little baking powder, and water. And here we see one of the elders uh, cooking uh, on an outdoor fire uh, using, and you can see the white, she'll be able to reclaim some of that ash and use that uh, in the future. So this new food uh, brings in the concept, food is our medicine. It's actually a fusion, right? We're fusing together components from those three historic periods and bringing them into a new way of presenting old dishes. And here you can see roasted corn in a pit, blue corn bread with ash, a blue corn uh, tamale with ash, uh, stews and soups, uh, also featuring uh, ash, squash. We see it in gnocchi. We do a, a blue corn gnocchi version. It's odd that that was your last time, uh, but also in uh, the salt, we mix the ash uh, with the salt. Um, this is what we're going to be demoing today. There's a white corn mush with fresh fruit, uh, layers uh, of uh, corn um, in different uh, glassware. And then the one we're doing today, which is the blue and the white uh, with boiled berries and um, we call this a Native American corn pudding parfait, which is made with the blue corn and white corn with ash. Uh, we see it in soups, we see it in our tamales, uh, the ash of course being used to make that masa or to make that hominy corn. Uh, it's in our blue corn bread. Uh, this is a native local source, Tamaya, one of the Pueblos to the south and that is the cornmeal uh, we're gonna be using today. So one of the things that Chef Walter and I really do and one of our big missions is new ways of making very old food. We take out some of those unhealthy uh, forced or introduced ingredients and bring back those indigenous uh, ingredients. And so education is really important in order to reclaim and revitalize. We need to educate all uh, levels, all ages, from small children all the way up, uh, workshops, classes, uh, and then the emphasis, of course, is that once this knowledge, this science is brought back, that uh, this is a way to connect and reconnect using uh, our ancestral foods. So TEK, very important. This is our indigenous science. We use that. Uh, in a, a very modern setting, a modern kitchen uh, to present food that is beautifully presented, but also uh, here we see corn three ways. This is Bertina Cadman, uh, again, bringing that ash uh, into the contemporary kitchen. Um, we can see here corn mush three ways. One is a white corn, one is a, a white corn with sumac, one is a blue corn, uh, all of which the ash 
is added uh, to that process to make this mush. Uh, we bring the old, the stirring sticks of the grandmothers into the modern or the contemporary kitchen and use those. And so there's room for everyone to participate, all nations, all colors, all ages. Uh, but the thing that we ask is that uh, the, the Native American agenda take priority when we revitalize and reinvigorate these foods uh, for health and wellness. And um, I don't know if all of you know, but it takes exactly one generation for uh, things to disappear, language, story, song, recipe. And so we use the spiral design in our food uh, to represent that knowledge starting at the beginning of time, spiraling outward four generations, child, adolescent, middle-aged, elder. It's up to all of these to come together to complete that circle, carry on that indigenous knowledge. So our elders need to pass that information onto our youth and our youth needs to be able to carry these on. So uh, college age is a, is a perfect age for you all to learn these and, and then carry them on through the technology that we have. Uh, I'm just gonna read this uh, in ending. Uh, this is Tidra, she grew up urban, so it doesn't matter if you grew up urban or on the reservation. When I'm around native foods, it reminds me of my grandma's house because that's what I got to eat when I would go home. Now, I'm trying to learn the importance of making the same food for myself and keeping these native foods alive in my own life. And so everybody's on their own journey and everybody needs to uh, help to revitalize and reinvigorate uh, these foods for health and wellness. So there's my uh, contact information and um, you're welcome to take a screenshot of that or a picture of that and uh, certainly reach out. I would encourage all of you to go on the website, see the books or the posters we've done and some of the foods, of course, that have been nixtamalized uh, that we sell there. So I'm gonna turn it over to Pia and she's gonna show you a little video uh, that we shot uh, on how to make ash. I'm gonna go into the kitchen and get ready and we are going then to move into uh, the food demo. So I will stop sharing uh, my screen and uh, turn it over to Pia and you guys are gonna watch the uh, video. My name is Lois Ellen Frank, and I'm the chef owner of Red Mesa Cuisine in Santa Fe, New Mexico. I'm going to show you how to make culinary ash from juniper. We're using branches from the juniper today. Uh, I've cut branches and cut them into small pieces, which I'm putting uh, on a tray, and we're going to put that in the oven. Culinary ash is very important in Native American cuisine history. This ash goes back thousands of years and native people have been using this ash to add nutrients including calcium to the cornmeal that we use for a variety of dishes one teaspoon of this culinary ash has the equivalent of calcium as a glass of milk so if we look historically back in our traditions most native people didn't use dairy and we didn't use dairy because we had our culinary ash. So culinary ash, very, very, very important. So I take my branches and I'm gonna put them in an oven and we're gonna let them cook. I actually have a tray of branches that have been cooking and nicely dried. And we're gonna take this outside and I'm gonna show you how to make the culinary ash. So let's go outside together and make culinary ash. that we want to do is we want to take some of these branches and we want to put them I'm using a metal wok which is safe to use and we want to just take this culinary ash light these branches so that the branches can burn and when the branches burn they start to turn white and it's this white part of the branches that we want to use for our culinary ash. So let the fire start to get with the orange flames and then we're going to actually take it, uh, I have a little 
fan here and I'm just gonna let those branches burn until they turn white. It's the white part of the ash that we're gonna be using for our traditional corn dish. Uh, and so we just wanna make sure that that burns properly and burns all the way through. Once you have your culinary ash, I just put it in a jar and then I have enough to use. So you could actually make uh, quite a bit or you can just make what you need. We need about a teaspoon uh, for our corn mush, our corn pudding that we're gonna do. And that's gonna be the next episode. And I'm gonna teach you how to do uh, corn mush layered together with boiled reduced berries. So take a look here at this. You can actually see that branches burning down. See that white part? That's the white part that we want to use uh, to strain for the culinary ash. So you can see those embers burning. That's exactly what we want uh, to use uh, for the culinary ash. So once everything has burned uh, all the way down, uh, you're just going to take a strainer and I've got just a household strainer here. I'm gonna take the ashes from the bottom of the pan, the white part of those ashes. You can actually see it gathering on the bottom and put it in a strainer. And then what we're gonna do is we're just gonna tap that strainer and you can actually see the ashes coming out on this. And for this particular recipe, see all that? That's the perfect ash. What we want is we only need about a teaspoon. We're going to have be able to make uh, more than that. So we're straining out the part that is not uh, all the way cooked or uh, not white. And take a look at this beautiful culinary ash here. This is exactly what we want. We actually have more than what we need for the recipe. We only need a teaspoon. And so we now have culinary ash and we're ready to uh, make uh, any of the corn dishes that require the culinary ash. So I just want to say thank you for joining us. And I want to say thank you to the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine and Sun Life Financial for their support uh, in the production of this video and uh, a big appreciation to them. And also Chef Walter Whitewater, who's been behind the camera. Thank you for doing a great job with the filming. We hope you'll join us for the next episode. And the next episode will show you how to make corn mush or corn pudding. We call it a corn parfait with the boiled berries. And so thank you for joining us and we look forward to seeing you for the next episode. Okay, so this is Chef Walter Whitewater. Hi everyone. And uh, he's gonna be filming and I'm gonna be making uh, the corn mush uh, and layering it together. So great, thank you. Yeah. Uh, so the first thing that we're going to do is uh, we'll start with the white. So we're going to start with uh, white corn and I am going to add the white corn and then we're going to measure out. So my culinary ash I just put into a uh, jar and we're going to measure out a teaspoon because that's what we're going to be using of the culinary ash. And then we want to mix this together uh, using either a traditional stirring stick or a whisk. Uh, we're using uh, one and a half cups of water and we're just going to take this uh, corn and we want to mix it together to make sure that we don't have any lumps. Uh, because once we add heat to this, um, it will be very difficult to get those out. So our ash and our corn uh, with cold water. And then in the background here, I have boiling water. So Walter will just uh, come around and um, I'm going to take the boiling water and we're going to add uh, to the boiling water that cold mixture uh, of the uh, corn and the ash. So let me show you that. And that's gonna be the first layer. So we wanna bring this in uh, nice and slowly. So I'm just gonna add a little bit and we wanna stir 
And as it heats, uh, porn is a natural thickening agent. You can actually see some little uh, pieces of that ash in the bowl. You can also see pieces uh, of the corn. There's that beautiful corn mush coming through the corn and we're gonna get all of that in. And then we're just, our heat is on uh, medium to high and we're going to take uh, this corn and we wanna stir it uh, until it begins to uh, thicken. So uh, this will take a, just a couple of minutes. And uh, what I'm going to do is layer this together with a berry compote that I made earlier. And uh, we're going to layer, and you can actually see here, this is the corn that we're using. Uh, this is the corn that has been uh, native grown. Uh, we're gonna put our uh, layer of corn into a hard plastic cup or glass. Um, and that's going to, uh, give us the first layer and then I'll take the berries. Uh, this takes a little longer to cook, so we didn't quite have enough time to uh, do that in today's lecture. Uh, but if any of you are uh, interested, we can certainly uh, get you the recipe uh, uh, for that. So once we have um, the uh, corn mush uh, thickened and in the uh, here we have our corn, it's just about ready. Um, on the back here, uh, the corn starts to thicken and boil. I just want you guys to take a look here at corn. You can see it bubbling. Look at how nice and, uh, that just from adding it. This, of course, is the white corn. Some people like to add uh, uh, Salt, so I will add a little bit of a uh, sea salt. That's going to bring in uh, some of that flavor. And then I'm also going to add just a little bit of agave. Again, agave using uh, our indigenous science uh, to process a plant um, that has some uh, uh, flavor. So because we're doing a uh, sweet, uh, we're going to just add a little bit uh, of that agave. So here we have the corn. Uh, the corn is ready. It's nice and thick. And um, this is going to be the first layer. So I'm just going to take that corn mush and you'll notice that as soon as I put it in, it's going to start to thicken. Uh, and this is the congealing process. This is sort of the Native American uh, jello. Of course, jello using gelatin or, or hooves of either cow or horse. Uh, and um, our corn mush just uses the ash and the water. And as soon as I put it in, it will start to thicken. Um, and you can actually see it. Uh, this is our pudding. It can be eaten warm. Uh, what my students at IAIA, they made this, of course, as part of uh, our science class. And um, what we did was we actually froze this uh, once uh, we had all the layers together and um, it makes a delicious frozen dessert uh, as well because the corn uh, solidifies, turns into uh, an ice cream um, and is absolutely uh, delicious. So uh, this uh, recipe makes about 12, a dozen, and I'm just going to finish Putting in, and you'll notice I'm trying not to get the uh, corn on the outside. And the reason is, is because we want that parfait to look pretty, uh, and you're, you're in a see-through either glass or hard, hard plastic container. And so what we really want to do is have that uh, not spill to the outside um, and uh, it makes for a much prettier um, uh, parfait. Uh, and as a chef, you know, Walter and I are, are artists. We, we uh, love presentation. Presentation, very, very important uh, to us, and um, uh, as well as flavor. Um, but uh, I think um, the majority of Americans uh, eat with their eyes, and um, that, that is uh, really important. Uh, so, uh, there we have our 12. Uh, the next thing that I'm going to do 
is start to um, get ready because I'm going to make a blue, but I'm going to put uh, the um, next layer, so the berries, again, uh, trying to be careful, watch those berries go in. I'm just using uh, a little bit on uh, each, and you can see that layer, uh, the colors, uh, this has beautiful flavor, and so the corn, uh, and it's actually very nutritious, layered together uh, with, and you can see the corn has already solidified, um, it's not bleeding, so it's a perfect uh, layer. You can see that uh, in these cups. And um, I wish all of you could be here to taste the, the, um, that we've experienced uh, with uh, COVID is we can see things virtual, but you don't have the smell or the aromas, the senses. And, you know, the, uh, the senses were a big part of uh, my PhD uh, in culinary anthropology uh, because um, experiential knowledge uh, is unlike um, any other knowledge and it's really important to be able to experience things. So I'm gonna put this to the side and we're gonna go to the next one. So same thing guys, blue corn, uh, ash, and my cold water. So I wanna make sure I have a cup and a half of cold water. And that's going to be added uh, to this. You can see the blue corn, and the blue corn has a beautiful color. Uh, Walter and I actually have been uh, all over the world, and uh, one of the big questions uh, that is always asked is, uh, how do you get your corn blue? <laughs> and nobody uh, in Guam or in the Philippines or any of the islands, uh, uh, as well as in Russia, believed that our corn grows blue. Uh, we don't diet, um, and so it was very difficult to explain to them that uh, our corn is naturally blue or naturally red or naturally white or naturally yellow uh, because they have not seen or experienced that. So again, I'm going to make another batch here. We're going to take two cups of boiling water, and that's going to go into our pan here, and then I am slow going to add my uh, the ash and the water getting all of that in there and then uh, for this one I'll show you how we would use uh, our stirring sticks and so the stirring sticks uh, are just made from a hard wood and the same way we would use a whisk we're going to stir that corn and uh, keep stirring it until it begins to thicken, which happens uh, fairly quickly. Um, and then once this mixture gets thick, uh, we're going to come over and add uh, that final layer uh, to our uh, corn pudding. And I just want to assure you that one of the, the beautiful things, I'm also going to add a little about it, that has happened uh, for us, at least during COVID, is we've been doing a lot of virtual classes and um, as we do the virtual classes, uh, we have food. And so I've gotten to know neighbors. I have a couple of elderly neighbors and they are now the recipients because uh, especially in the beginning, they didn't want to leave their homes. Uh, we put, we text them and we put the food in their mailbox so they don't have to leave. And we're feeding them uh, nutritious uh, and delicious food um, for health and wellness. So, uh, uh, there's always a blessing in disguise in everything that we do, that sort of a native way of looking at uh, things and how we approach, uh, um, I guess you would say you make lemonade from lemons, right? And so we've really learned uh, how to um, have a sense of community and feed those in need uh, with the little that we're doing. So here you can see this beautiful corn mush. Walter will zoom in on that. And see, it's getting nice and thick. Look at that gorgeous color. Uh, of course, that color only coming uh, from the blue corn. You can see it bubbling, and that's why we want to keep stirring nice and thick. So I'm going to come over here now, and uh, we'll do our next uh, layer of uh, corn. And so uh, now we're just going to take that corn. We're going to put another layer on top. And you could stop here 
Uh, I like to make enough berries so that uh, I can do um, a full cup, uh, not only because it looks beautiful, but also because uh, it's so good that we want to make sure that we eat uh, a full serving of this. Um, so we have the white on the bottom and then uh, the blue on top. So berries, white berries and blue. Let's do a couple more. And then I'm going to show you how we would uh, garnish this. And uh, here in New Mexico, we have uh, the pecan. Uh, the pecan is an indigenous nut. Actually, the word is, the word pecan is Native American. Uh, it actually means a nut that the crows could break. And it was, in fact, the crows uh, that were able to spread it uh, from what is now known as the Deep South or the Southern uh, Eastern United States uh, westward. And um, now here in New Mexico, the pecan is our number one nut crop. Uh, in the billions of dollars. So it's a very important uh, nut and that's what we're going to be garnishing with. But you could also garnish with a pine nut, uh, um, which is also indigenous um, and these both very important. This year uh, you can drive anywhere and everybody's pulled over on the side of our highways uh, and they are in fact harvesting the pine nut or what we call the pinon here in New Mexico uh, because now is the the season uh, for harvest. So um, uh, everybody has been out uh, harvesting. And um, here again, finishing up that corn so we don't have any waste. And then the last thing I'm gonna do is put uh, a little more of that berry. And uh, Walter has graciously um, chopped some pine nuts and I had some mint from the garden uh, um, and we're gonna uh, we haven't had a hard freeze yet so I can show you uh, how to to do that um, uh, I don't know how cold it's been uh, on the east coast but here is our last layer I'm gonna put some of these uh, to the front so you guys some pretty ones so you can see and uh, we have um, a gorgeous uh, dish that is really, really healthy. Lots of fiber using our ancestral foods. Uh, we're gonna just top it with some of the toasted uh, pecans. You could use the toasted uh, pine nuts. And then the last thing, this adds a little texture. It also adds some uh, additional nutrients is to just take a little of uh, mint and uh, garnish that beautiful parfait. Uh, it, oh, look at that side, Walter. He can get down. You can really take a look at those layers, um, how beautiful they are. And uh, that was easy. We did that in uh, just about 10 minutes. Um, and uh, beautiful, beautiful. Um, with lots of flavor uh, using our traditional ancestral ingredients and a form of our indigenous science. So uh, this is something that if you guys bought cornmeal, you could do uh, as home as well. It's, it's quite um, easy to do. So I think we're going to open it up to some questions and I'm happy to take some questions. Uh, if um, I think Patricia or Pia will moderate that for me. Thank you, Lois. That was amazing. I think we're all clapping in our homes. You, you can't hear it the way this works, but we're, please know we're all clapping. Um, so we have, uh, we have some time for questions. And if you guys out in the audience, if you have not noticed, there is a little button in the lower bar called Q&A. So feel free to add any questions there and we'll see how many we get to. I also have one announcement. We often get the question, um, if these are being taped, if they're being recorded, and yes, they are. And we're going to add the link in the chat to where you can find them all. And the second thing I, I wanted to ask you, so in the very beginning of this, this lecture, we threw up this poll 
asking you uh, which of the following foods involve the scientific concept of diffusion, pasta, steak, ceviche, molten chocolate cake, blue corn mush. So you now get a chance to, to answer it again and see if uh, you would change your answer or, or say the same thing. And the second question is, which of the following is true about cooking with ash? Is it acidic, basic, contains calcium, is flavorful, I have no idea. So take a minute and just tell us what you think. And, uh, and we can actually show that, that, um, that I think at least I, I learned a lot in this lecture. Let's hope, let's hope we all did. Um, so let's see, as you're answering in, in the poll, I have, I have a number of questions and there are several questions that are touching on the same thing. So how about, how about I just ask you, could you please repeat how much corn flour, how much ash and how much water? Right, um, so that, that's great, yeah. So we used one cup of very finely ground blue corn or white corn. You could also do yellow uh, or red. Uh, we mostly use blue and white here. Uh, we added one teaspoon of ash. One teaspoon of ash has the equivalent of calcium of two glasses of milk, so lots of calcium. It also has manganese, magnesium, phosphorus, lots of minerals. Uh, so one teaspoon of ash, one cup of the corn, finely ground cornmeal, one and a half cups of water, and that's part one. And then we have two cups of water that boil, and we add the cold mixture, always cold to hot, uh, because that gives us the ability to not create lumps or air pockets because hot and cold uh, mixing together. So two cups boiling water, one and a half cups cold water, one cup corn flour, one teaspoon ash, and then a little bit of salt or agave, depending on if you're making it. A lot of people here like to just make the mush and add red chili to it. So you can make it savory, but you can also make it sweet. Today we did sweet. Uh, and I see, I see that Patricia added all of this in the chat. So, so take a look there if you didn't catch all that. Great, that's perfect. So I think the follow-up question we all have is, well, okay, where do I get my ash and where do I get my flour? Um, okay. What are your so, thoughts? Uh, at Red Mesa, we started selling the corn flour so you could buy from us if you wanted. Uh, there's other people you could, um, I believe, madeinnewmexico.com also sells it. Um, and then uh, I, I noticed on Etsy, because I've never bought ash, I've only made it. Uh, if you Google Native American culinary ash, there are some grandmas selling uh, little packets of the ash, which is pretty cool because you're supporting, and this is where that food movement comes in. You're buying directly from a Native uh, American grandma or a woman or a community member that's making the ash, so you can actually buy it online. So. Uh, uh, lots of sources uh, for the cornmeal, uh, also uh, for the ash. So, uh, and uh, Chef Walter was saying, come on, Chef Walter, and, and come over here when we do uh, the questions. Uh, come on around, come on around so people can see you. Um, and uh, uh, also, where would you get ash? We just drive into the supermarket and they sell it in coffee cans. Mm -hmm. So if we're not gonna make it, but unless you wanted to drive out to our reservations and do that, you have to order online. Or I couldn't make it. Or Walter can make it for you. Yeah. So, but uh, there are grandmas selling it. Good question. Um, there is a lot of questions about, so let, let's say you wanted to make your ash yourself. Can you make it from anything is one question. Another person is asking, uh, how about rosemary and, and thyme? Are those good ones? Um, what, what, are there reasons for why you use one over the other? What are your thoughts on that? So we use what is indigenous and what's available. So our wild onion, our four wing salt bush, and our juniper are what's available. And because we've been making it this way for thousands of years, uh, we know the nutrients and the flavor profile of that. But many East Coast tribes have used some of the wood ash from trees on the East Coast. Uh, I'm not an expert in that uh, because I don't live in the Eastern Woodlands and that's not my tribal affiliation but there are tribes that are doing that. So I, I guess you would have to experiment a little uh, on um, what to use. What I can say is that you wanna make sure you're using the white 
and you must strain it because uh, pieces of wood can be in that ash. So you can see mine is uh, really finely uh, ground, run through a strainer so that we're not getting any particles in, in, in what we're eating. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great, right? good question. Um, is the juniper a specific type of juniper? Uh, so this is the uh, juniper, which is in the cedar family. I'd have to, uh, because I'm back here, I don't have in front of me uh, the actual botanical name, but uh, I do look up the botanical name always and make sure, and we use the branches. Actually, Walter, will you go cut a piece, a little branch outside? Cedar. Uh, cedar. So it's the juniper, uh, the wood would be cedar, which many of our homes are built on here. Uh, but um, it's the juniper that's indigenous here in the Southwest. I don't know if you have juniper uh, on the East Coast or in other parts of the country, but um, yeah, good question. Yeah. Um, let's see, we have lots of questions about nixtamalization. Oh, and here are the answers to the What our little branches look like. So we're using the green part of uh, the uh, juniper. And we also use this in our ceremonies. It might be used uh, in a ceremony or a sweat lodge or for smudging, um, sort of the same way. And, and, and the aroma, the smell uh, is amazing. So it has a very distinct smell and, and this produces the most calcium that we know of. Uh, and the Navajos really use uh, this ash a lot. So mixed alumization question. Um, yes, but actually, since the poll, the poll just started sharing. So let's just quickly take a look at that. So it looks like 86% percent of you for the first question answered that it's all of the above. And that is correct. There is diffusion in all of the ones above. Awesome. Um, and for the second question, yes, ash is basic. Yes, ash contains calcium. And yes, it is flavorful. So, um, and it looks like most of you got, got these right. So that's awesome. Awesome, we all learned something. Okay, so next demolization. Um, so so um, the, the corn has already been nixtamalized. Is that, that's right. So, uh, so this corn is not nixtamalized. We would take our fingers and get the kernels off and soak the corn in an ash solution. There, it's going to start to pop because water is going to start to enter. Uh, and then we're going to slowly cook it and the skins will start to come off. We remove the skins by hand and the inside of the corn kernel becomes the masa. That masa can be used whole. Uh, that would be hominy corn or fasoli corn, or it can be ground into a powder and made into tortillas or tamales. So when you buy, when you go and, and uh, one of the big brands, I think Quaker Oats is now making uh, mixed alumazide corn for corn tortillas or tamales. Uh, that corn has been treated. You wanna make sure, I'm a big proponent of uh, non-GMO, so I would uh, definitely buy a brand where uh, it, it is organic or says that, but that is the treated corn and that's the powdered corn that we use for uh, tortillas or tamales. Okay, so um, so there, there are a few questions about Okay, so if the corn is nixtamalized, but then you're adding the extra corn, uh, does, what does that do sort of in your words? What, is the, what does it do to the texture what, what, and, and the flavor? Is it both or, or um, how, okay. how do you describe it since so, you have it right there and we can't touch it? <laughs> so if I understand the, the question, the corn that I use today, the powder, not nixtamalized. It's just ground. So we took corn, ground it into a powder, and then added the ash, okay? It was not nixtamalized, so I've added ash once. Corn for making tortillas or tamales is already nixtamalized. It's already treated with either ash or lime. And so we don't add ash again. We add just water, and we make the masa or the dough, and then we cook it. So two different ways of using ash. One is to treat the corn and then grind it into a powder or use those kernels. The other is to take corn that's been ground and then add the ash. So what I did today was I did not do mixed alumization. That process takes overnight, hours, hours and hours. So I did not nixtamalize the corn. I added ash to the corn. 
Okay. Okay. Perfect. I think I think we're all glad you clarified that. That's very good. Yeah. Um, yeah. There is. So you mentioned the stirring sticks. Could you talk more about some of other indigenous culinary technology and how important it is for preparing the food properly? Well, I'm gonna bring Walter around. So these are actually from uh, a gift to me from Walter's grandmother. Uh, this has three, this has seven. Um, and uh, the, the belief is that when we use this, we're bringing in knowledge through the stick into the food and making that knowledge be able to be passed on. As soon as I use a metal tool, no longer bringing in indigenous knowledge, I'm just cooking uh, uh, in a contemporary way. So we like to bring the old in to, to call those ancestors in. We never waste. You'll notice I was scraping the corn. Uh, we always put stuff back to the earth. Some of you might know this as composting. We just call it making an offering back to the earth, especially with our wild and our sacred foods. So nothing is wasted. Don't forget, we, we follow a medicine wheel. We follow everything is connected to everything else. Do you wanna just add a couple of words to that? <clears throat> well, these are, uh, they have stories to each one, each one of them. And so when you come to, in, at the age of uh, women, so there's always a gift it's been passed down to. And that's what you carry on the, like Lois talks about the knowledge and the, there's a teaching that, that goes with it. And then and that's what we use in our, um, not only in our ceremonies, but um, in our cooking. So that's just the way, um, I know if I, if I start telling you about the whole story in my native way, it's gonna take like a hey. But was, uh, like a grinding stone or a mortar and pestle or a clay pot or uh, stirring sticks, or uh, there's lots of other of tools uh, ancestral tools that we can bring into the modern kitchen. And I use my mortar and pestle. You saw my students, I make them grind. They were grinding the corn. The uh, stones like to live outside because they're stone. We tried to bring them inside and they're just not happy. So we leave them outside. Mm -hmm. uh, sticks like to be inside. So we, we have them inside. Mortar and pestles inside. So all of those are used, yeah. Okay, great, thank you. I think, I think, this would probably be a good place to end. Thank you both so much, Lois and Walter. This was amazing. And I think I speak for all of us when I say thank you so much. And thank you to all of you out there for tuning in. And next week we have Jose Andres. So please come back and uh, hopefully you'll be making some uh, amazing corn parfait before then. Okay, thanks everyone. Thank you again Bye. to you. Thank you for having us. Thank you.